to the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Corpodian. Hey everyone, I'm incredibly excited and truly honored to introduce the guest we have today. He's a serial entrepreneur who co-founded 2014's Inc. 500 company, Quest Nutrition, which became a unicorn startup valued at over a billion dollars. Amazing. With over a thousand employees, they're well on their way to accomplish their mission to end metabolic disease, which I love. Uh, He was the host of the viral YouTube series, Inside Quest, which was viewed over a hundred million times. And most people might've stopped there, but not this man. Alongside his wife, he became the co-founder and host of the widely popular Impact Theory Show. And he's also on the innovation board at the X Prize Foundation. But it seems this full time, your full time job is to free people from the matrix and help them unlock their true potential. Guys, I give you none other, a true inspiration, Mr. Tom Bilyeu. What is up, dude? <laughs> I'm just so honored to be here at your studio. It is an incredible experience to be able to interview. So thank you very much for being on the show. Dude, thank you for being here. And for anybody listening, uh, the story of how we met face to face is a good one because people are always like, you know, how do you get so-and-so to be on your podcast or whatever? I was hosting a live event. You came, you were total value add to the community. It's when you're doing live events, getting people to come is like the big thing. So when you, you approached me and said, Hey, I'd really like to interview you. I was like, dude, you came out tonight. You supported hundred percent. Let's do it. So find ways to add value boys and girls. That is the key. I'm so glad you said that because it was interesting. I went to that networking event. I was like, I just want to meet him and talk to you. And I really felt a, a connection with you, especially talking because you really spend time. And the cool thing was I'd reach out to you on Instagram and you made note, you absolutely talk to every, you write every single one of those messages and you talk to all your fans, which I think is huge for building a community. No question. So I want to get to know you a little bit more. It seems that you could pretty much accomplish anything at this point. How did this start? Like, were you always like this? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's funny. So there's really been phases in my life. So I used to be, uh, a terrible employee. I kept my head down, did as little work as possible and avoided punishment at all costs. That was, uh, how I came up. So I went to film school. I was deeply passionate about that, but then I totally crashed and burned in film school. It was very embarrassing. It was like one of those ascend to the heights, crash to the lows. And because that was so just absolutely emotionally devastating, I come back out the other side, putting my head down again, feeling totally lost, not knowing how I'm going to do anything with my life. For some weird reason, I was thinking about that this morning. And I really, really felt a deep sense of being lost and hopeless. And I did not know how to actually make my dreams come true. And it's funny, I talk about that in the intro to all of my impact theory shows. You know, I say, look, I'm trying to introduce you to the people and ideas that are going to help you actually execute on your dreams because I did not know how to do that. And this is all pre-internet, pre-social media. So it was like, literally, how do you do it? I was trying to crack the Hollywood nut, which is like, the hardest thing, it's still hard. And it's way easier today when you can upload something to YouTube than it was back in the day. And so I just literally was paralyzed with not knowing what is the first step, let alone the 100th step. So I definitely did not start where I'm at now. It's really all about mindset. Once you have the mindset, then you can reverse engineer what the steps are through researching and learning and all of that. But if you don't even have the first step of, oh, I need to research and learn, then there's literally this sense of if The answer does not present itself. If it does not come to you, you don't know what to do. So it really was a very long journey of getting my mind in the right place, which came from multiple times in my life of just truly being desperate. So I was emotionally desperate after film school, did not know what I was going to do. And I did not like the way that I felt. And the easiest way to to sum up, I won't say that I was depressed. Maybe if you compared it to where I am emotionally now, maybe, But at the time I would come home from work and I would lay on the floor. I didn't have like hardly any furniture. I, did I have a couch? I may have had a couch. I can't remember if I already had it by that point, but the the only couch that I had back then was this white leather couch that I'd gotten as a hand-me-down that was so uncomfortable. We used to sit on the floor and lean against it just to give you an idea. And I would lay on my floor because I didn't have much furniture and just press my face into the carpet and just like sit there and what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do with my life? So 
clawing my way out of that was necessary because I could just feel how dangerous it was to sit there. And so I found teaching and they say, if you want to learn something, teach. So as I was teaching film, I began learning more about film, which gave me this sense that I actually could get better at it, which was my big fear coming out of film school and failing was I just don't have the talent. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have the talent, I can't ever get the talent. That wasn't even like a thought. I just thought you, you either are naturally talented or you're not. And film school had shown me I was not naturally talented. And so now what? So teaching it really began to plant the seed that, oh, wait, you actually can learn and get better, even at something like art. So that was a huge revelation to me. I can't overstate like how freeing that was. And then I started my own company, Billy Photography. And that like was the first time where my efforts equaled money. Mm. And so that was surreal. So you're now not tied to just like an hourly wage from your employer. How hard do you hustle? And that actually equates to real dollars. So that was wildly intoxicating. And then I met the entrepreneurs that ended up becoming my partners much later down the road in Quest. But in the beginning, they were just essentially teaching me how to think, which was transformative. And I know one of the books you recommend, which I recently uh, read myself, actually, for the first time, I can't believe I haven't read it, was Mindset. And that idea of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So when you were starting out, it sounds like you were more in that fixed mindset aspect and you don't even know how to start. And I've been depressed too. I mean, and I called it depressed. I mean, I was miserable. I went to sleep depressed. I woke up depressed. I went through my day depressed. And it took me about eight years before basically out of desperation. I mean, it wasn't, I was coasting, I was surviving, mm -hmm. but I wasn't being successful in terms that I explained. And so eventually out of desperation, when I finally hit my lowest low point, that's when I started learning and started growing and said, there's got to be a way, I've got to find a way to get out of this. So to begin with, how do you define success? And did your definition of success change? Because when you were you know, a younger entrepreneur trying to get money, or is it different now that you've you know, made money and you're looking, you have a show literally called Impact Theory? Yeah. I, in the beginning, if I'm honest, I never really thought about defining success. Uh, so it'd be a bit of a lie to say, oh, I used to have this definition and now it's this, but sort of hiding behind my every the things that got me excited, the things that I was pursuing was all money, yeah. just pure money. And so, yeah, I, if you had forced me to externalize, like, what's your definition of success, it would have been money. Like you've, you've made money. Although I suppose I would have said, and I've got, you know, I've made my money making films that touch a lot of people. That was always a thing for me. And even in film school, and that's where I came up with the analogy, I guess, of every, person, especially now where you've got shows like this or possible where they weren't back, you know, 15 years ago, everybody has to decide, do you want to masturbate or make love? And in film school, like it just seemed like everybody wanted to masturbate. It was all about me, me, me. I want to create art for okay. me. Right. And so that's it. Like I, it was almost like gross to say that you were thinking about your audience and that you wanted to make a film with mass appeal. And people are going through that same thing now with money, with businesses, right? They want to be pure to something that I don't understand. My thing is I want to impact massive amounts of people. I want to impact people at scale. My obsession is scale. I want to do things big. You and I were talking about that before we started rolling. Like scale is what matters to me. So you can ask people, you know, would you rather pull one, uh, help one person or, and that person knows you and knows that you changed their life. And like they show up at your funeral and they're weeping and banging on the casket. Or would you rather help a million people and they don't know who you are? I'd rather help a million people that don't know who I am. hundred percent. Like doing things at scale, like that's the juice. That to me is making love where you have to think about your audience. I just want to say thank you for clarifying between masturbating and making love right there. I was, I wasn't sure where we were going. You're hoping I was going to bring that all around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, that's the difference, right? Like whether you're doing something just for yourself or whether you really want to do something at scale. So even back then, like I had that concept of, I want to do things at scale. I want to make movies that touch millions of people. Uh, and so that's been consistent. And so I would still say that's very much a part of my definition of success. But while I think money is, is more powerful than people think, it just isn't at all what you think. Mm -hmm. So money is a great facilitator, but in and of itself, it is, it is totally inert. So getting a lot of money is not going to change the way you feel about yourself. It's not going to pull you out of a depression, nothing. So all the things that people think money is going to do, it's not. And all the things that they sort of don't even think about, it's where it's real power lies. So Bill Gates is going to cure malaria, but he's going to do it because he has access to billions of dollars. Yeah. So having 
a sense of what you want the money to do is insanely powerful. So once you know why you're pursuing money, then it gets very interesting. But I didn't know. And so I was lost in that ridiculous cliche of money can't buy happiness. So my definition now of success is still very much something at scale, but fulfillment is a huge part of it. But I do want to build the the success that I'm chasing, and I don't expect everyone to be chasing this, but the success that I'm chasing is very much tied to business success. Like, can you build a profitable entity that serves other people? And so I, there's a weird movement happening now where people are like super bizarre about money. And if you the world's like bifurcating and you get like still the legions of people that are into fast cars and big houses. But now you get like this legion of people that eschew money and they're making a catastrophic error. Right. I, I completely agree. And I, I had that kind of weird internal struggle. So growing up, my parents really didn't have stability with money. So they were bankrupt a couple of times and we constantly had to move and I never felt that. So, you know, I went to dental school in the idea that kind of led by my dad that that would be a stable position, stable job, and that I'd always have money. And I was going after money, but at the same time, I didn't want to make too much money because then people kind of look at you weird, like you're greedy or you want too much. And I came out, I started making more money than I ever did. And I was totally just miserable. And I came to this point in life. So I look at your story too, where you came to that point where money is so powerful. And I I do want to make a lot of money. I'm not going to play around with that. I want money still, but it's not my primary driver anymore, right? So my primary driver is to make an impact. But I realized that if I don't have money to support those efforts, I'm not going to make as big of an impact as I want. And I think that's what you're kind of getting to. And I I wanted to go back to that time where you you kind of talk about a few times where you're sitting in the boardroom, you know, you're overlooking the ocean, I think it was, and you're saying, I've made all this money and I'm completely miserable. I want to know because I made the same mistake, right? I was chasing that. What could we tell somebody that is starting out on their journey right now? They're chasing money. They're trying to grow. And so that they don't end up at that same point at the end of the road where they have this desperate moment of change where they have to change or they just want to throw it all away. They're just so out of sync with what they thought they were going to get. You know, I always say this, when I get to the end, end of the rainbow, I'm going to get a pot of gold. And I got to the end of the rainbow and there was just nothing. Yeah, this is tough. And I don't know if this is one of those lessons that people just have to learn the hard way, because I don't know if anybody could have said anything that would make me internalize at such a deep and profound level that money isn't the answer until you get it. And there's that wonderful Jim Carrey quote where he says, I wish everyone could be rich and famous so you'd see it's not the answer. And, but at the same time, like, Because money is real. And this is why it's confusing. Money is real. And so when people tell you that like money um, isn't the answer, it's like, but you're looking at it going, but it does solve problems. And money does solve problems. What people don't understand is money only solves money problems. So I'm going to give, I'm going to, I'll tell one sort of story, anecdote, whatever you want to think of it as. And this is either going to be the thing that changes people or they're, they're just still going to do it no matter what. So it goes like this. You look at somebody that has money, they have the cars, they have the houses, all of it, and you feel adoration for them, admiration, maybe a little bit of jealousy, you covet what they have, and it's incredibly powerful. And you look at them with like reverence and awe. And somewhere in the back of your mind is a secret little lie that you think you'll feel the same way about yourself if you had that money. And here's the bad news you won't. So I have lived through the very weird position of building a ton of value by always reinvesting every dime that I made back into the company. So that then finally one day, your company is worth all this money. We were valued at over a billion dollars, but my life was still the same until one day you sell a little piece of that company. And now the amount, even at a small percentage, the amount of raw dollars that you get is insanity. And so I'm literally hitting refresh on my bank account. Refresh, 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 refresh. And all of a sudden, a whole lot of commas and zeros are in my bank account. And you're like freaking out (laughs) and you're (laughs) celebrating. And then all of a sudden you realize, huh, I don't feel any differently. All of the insecurities that I have are still here. All of the doubts about myself are still here. All of the things that are wondrous and exciting are still here. My 
freakish amount of connection and love and joy with just being with my wife in a dive restaurant that cost $26 at the end of the day. That's all still there. So nothing has changed, but now I can facilitate other things. But how I felt about myself did not change. So in that moment, it was like the biggest eye-opening thing. For instance, my employees could never tell you what day the money hit my bank account because I showed up like normal and was grinding it out just like normal and living my life. So because people think it is going to change something fundamental inside of them, they chase it so fucking hard. But as they're getting more and more money, they never stop to go, well, none, like it, you just keep pushing the amount of money off that you think is going to have this impact on you. And so when you're making, like when I was making $50,000, the thought of making $150,000 was like, oh my God, that's so much money. And then you get there and you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, if I was making a million dollars a year, I'll feel, nope. And when you're making a million, it's going to be well, when I'm making 10. And when you're making 10, it's going to be when I'm making a hundred. It, and it's only because you never stop to reflect on the fact that the only thing that changes the way you feel about yourself is when you act in a way that makes you proud. That's it. I completely agree. And it's funny because I think a lot of people get struggle with the idea of I need money to survive. And that's true. You need a certain amount of money to survive people's definition of surviving, whether you're in a giant house or a small little apartment or you drive a nice car, like that's what they need to survive. But once you make a little bit more than that, everything else, I mean, you're, you're stable, you can pursue whatever you want. And, but the thing is you're constantly still pursuing more, more money. Your definite goal is just more, more, more. And I've been there too. And I, I thought about it. I was like, you know what? I don't actually need to make that much money. In fact, I left one of my offices and it was about a hundred thousand dollar a year cut in the amount of money I'd make. Why? Because I wanted to pursue something more meaningful. I wanted to pursue my passions. I had all these ideas, doing a podcast, writing a book, speaking in front of people, teaching these things that helped me so much. And I didn't do it because I needed more money. I was like, you know, another year went by a year. I wrote 15,000 words for a book. I had uh, designed this podcast logo. I got everything set up. A year goes by and I wake up and I turn 31. And I go, you know what? No more. That day, um, a month before we started setting up, I was like, what am I going to do for my birthday? I wanted to speak on my birthday. And I just spoke, spoke at a uh, small community uh, group, about 10 to 15 kids. And I did a, a series of talks for them. I did about seven talks. But that to me was more meaningful and then I, I've launched the podcast, everything's rolling and I've, I've got the book going and I'm more excited about that than anything else. But it's because I had enough money, one, to say, I don't need the extra money. And I had the whereabouts to say, you know, what's really important to me. And I think that that's a defining factor for some people once they understand how to survive. Um, I obviously haven't had the success of a billion dollar company in adding zeros, but I always say it's funny because at the end of the day, after I do a talk and I, these kids coming up to me and they're, you know, 20 to 24 years old. And they're like, thank you so much for coming. And they got me, it was my birthday. I actually got to do a talk on my birthday. And they're like, are you sure you want to come in? I'm like, no, that's what I want to do on my day at 7 PM. I went in there, gave an hour and a half, two hour talk and loved it. They appreciate it so much. But at the end of the day, I walk home, I still have to take out the trash. That's it. You know, you still go on. I mean, you make an impact on people's lives. You make more money. You don't, you still have to do, you still have to live your life. So I understand that I didn't have tons of zeros adding to my bank account, but there were a few. Um, I also want to talk about as I don't understand, or I, maybe I don't, not that I don't understand. I haven't heard you, um, the time frame. I know the matrix came out in 1999 and you're a big fan of the matrix. Uh, you also, you built this company and you started quest in 2010. How, when did you see the matrix and make that connection to you know, the belief is the contract and you want to add, create a value, uh, ad company. When was that moment where you're like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to shift it. So you, when did you see the matrix basically? Start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a the very different answers. Um, so here's what you're struggling with. So everybody, and this is why impact theory exists. So mythology is the most important construct the human mind can leverage. So what you're grappling with is there's the mythology of my life, which I have 
packaged up neatly so people can understand like those key moments of awakening or transference or, you know, whatever it was that was going on in my life that people then can try to assimilate into their own life and say, okay, how could I use that? Um, versus the messiness of my real life, which is two steps forward, sometimes one step back, sometimes 1.99 steps back, sometimes three steps back, right? So it's th the messiness of it all is A, not useful and B, impossible to tell. Right. So, but the timeline, and I'm just going to rush through this so that you can get a sense. So in 99, I see the movie actually before it comes out. Um, I, ha I was at a comic convention. I am a total geek for comic books. And I'm at this convention. I walk around the corner. There's Keanu Reeves, Joe Pantaleone, Carrie and Moss, um, the whole awesome. the whole crew. And they're handing out free tickets to the movie screening that night at Warner Brothers Studios. I go. It blows me away. But upon first viewing, I see it as a film buff. I don't see it as like, oh my God, this is going to change my life. But it like plants these ideas in my head. Now, I'm somebody who thinks in story. So up to that point, I have all these movies to draw from and moments in my life where I'm like, oh, that reminds me of this. And what's the takeaway lesson from that? And the matrix just sort of more and more becomes that story over years that I lean on to explain to people. And as my life begins to change and my mindset begins to change, I just keep finding myself thinking about Morpheus and Neo and like, and you begin to realize like how perfect a metaphor that movie is for mindset. But at the time I didn't even know the word mindset. I wasn't thinking about that. I didn't know fixed mindset, growth mindset. So I certainly wasn't saying, oh my God, this movie's like the perfect explanation of a fixed mindset yeah. and a growth mindset. So I just didn't think like that. But the seed is there and it develops over time. So after that, I'm still in the crisis because I graduated in 98 from film school. I have that catastrophic failure. I see the matrix in the period where I'm laying with my face in the carpet. <laughs> and it's not like all I do is lay my face in the carpet. I see the movie and now suddenly it picks me up. It's I have good days and I have bad days and I feel like I'm going to make my dreams come true somehow. I just don't know how. And I'm trying Billy photography and it's like, gives me the first glimpses that something could be and I'm teaching and that's giving me glimpses. And then I fall in love and she gives me a sense that I could be more than I've thought. And she believes in me sometimes more than I believe in myself. And, and then in all of that, I then meet these entrepreneurs and at first they just hire me as a copywriter. And so I'm just another employee, but I'm with these guys that are like, stop thinking of yourself as a fucking copywriter and realize you're in a startup and you can do anything you set your mind to. You just have to become the right person for the job. And they're not in any way, shape or form trying to facilitate my growth. They're trying to get the most out of me. So there's a lot of like just getting the shit kicked out of me day after day after day. And realizing, well, this is going to be what I make of it. And so in that process, I begin codifying largely because there were times where I was so angry with them because they were just pushing me and pushing me and pushing me. And you have to like either quit, which is what most people do, or find a way mentally to understand what you're going through. And so... I begin thinking about the matrix more and like how that relates and like, what is my Kung Fu and you know, what's my version of jacking into the matrix. And so I start reading more cause that's my version of jacking into the matrix. And I begin, begin to realize that business is my Kung Fu and that if I can learn this, cause their whole pitch to me at the beginning was come work for us. Cause you're coming to the world with your hand out. And if you want to control your art and really be a filmmaker, then you're going to have to get rich. So it was like, I had this goal. I wanted to get rich. I've been very goal oriented. And a lot of my conflicts and codifications arose out of realizing I was not acting in accordance with, I say, I want to get rich, but I'm acting like I just want to feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. And so in this whole muddy period from like, God, when did I, I didn't even meet them until 2003. I got married in 2002. I met my wife in 2000. So it's like, all these little moments are like stacking on themselves. The sort of no man's land of beginning to transform who I was, was from 98, where I had that just emotional devastation of failing at film school to call it 2003, when I really began in business. So I've got this like five year wasteland period of laying the foundation of emotional suffering of reading things like the power of myth, which you want to talk about something that fucked me up in a positive way. And by the way, be became that thing that really let me take the matrix seriously. Let me take star Wars seriously and begin to go. I actually want to be a Jedi. Like I actually like think of Jedi as a religion. Like I want to adopt the way that they think and like, when he says, you know, he can lift a rock, but he can't lift the, the X wing. And Yoda says, you know, 
It's only different in your mind. It's not actually different. You like can, all these things I start taking seriously. Go ahead. And it takes like uh, the same amount of energy to, to build a million dollar company as it does to build a hundred million dollar company in certain ways, right? I mean, we all have the same amount of time in the day. So lifting a stone or lifting a wing, it's just how do you spend that time, right? So um, you had so much in there. That's just amazing. Why are you so passionate about grabbing people and freeing them from the matrix? At the end of the day, there's things that just turn us all on and partly because I'm wired for that when I was five years old. And I don't give a lot of credit to like our starting point, but I do think that we all come sort of with predispositions towards certain things. And at five years old, I pretended not to see an Easter egg so my sister could find it because she cared more about winning than I did. So that's just always been a thing for me. I love to see other people win. I love to see them get excited. Now, it doesn't mean I don't want to win myself. It just means that I really, really enjoy that. So being on a team is incredibly meaningful to me and seeing my teammates win and creating space for them to shine, like that's all meaningful. So that's part of it. The other part is in changing my own mindset, it changed everything about my life from the degrees to which I can embrace gratitude and really live in a state of fulfillment and happiness, change that to just real world financial success and the things that's that that has facilitated in my life too. And we're, look, we're actually going to build this fucking studio and I get it. Like people can't see it right now. And the number of people that look at me like I'm an asshole is hilarious to me because I know I am so relentless that looking back every 10 years, my life is unrecognizable because when people are busy laughing, when they're busy not paying attention, whatever, I'm just fucking working day after day after day. I'm working. How do you stay? I, I, I love it because I'm, I'm the same way. And me three years ago, five years ago, completely different person. How do you stay so focused on the goal? How do you stay so motivated? And what do you do if you have a bad day? That all comes down to hunger. How badly do you want it? So I fan the flames of my hunger by obsessively thinking about the things that first start off as interests, then they become fascination. And then through a deep level of engagement and gaining of mastery, they become real passions, burning hungers. But you have to focus on it. You have to like fan those flames. You have to tell people that you're into it. You have to say it out loud. You have to do things like what I'm doing right now. I am literally in talking to you about this. I'm reinforcing in my own mind the truth of it, right? And so if it started out as like a, we're going to build this studio, like, Five years later, it's like, I'm fucking eating the mic. I'm grabbing it. Like, we're going to do this. <laughs> you know? So it's, you, you're reinforcing it in yourself, reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing. And just one, let's talk about the thing nobody wants to talk about. I understand neuroscience. I understand the brain, neuroanatomy. I get how this shit works. I understand how myelination, brain plasticity. So I'm leveraging those things against me to get me where I know I need to be. So by nature, I want to sit around and do nothing like everybody else. I want to eat, be morbidly obese and play video games. That is the truth of like whatever weird little thing is that sits at the center of all of us. But it comes into competition with the other thing that sits in the center of us, the desire to matter, to have purpose, to accomplish, to climb mountains, to crush it, right? So it's like the old story, whatever wolf you feed becomes the stronger wolf. Absolutely. And so where did you start? I'm just curious as a lot of people have this bad habit, like, uh, you know, work Monday through Friday, Saturday, Friday night, even Thursday night, even start to party and do kind of just repeat. And then they wake up Monday morning and they're just miserable. How did you break that cycle and then slowly reinforce or maybe quickly reinforce positive habits into it? I, 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 I wanted to be rich. <laughs> I can't say that enough. And that's how it started. And I saw, I luckily understood early enough that I could get rich doing something that I loved, which was filmmaking. And by the way, if that path had worked, I really wonder what my mindset would be like, because I would believe in natural talent. And I would just say, you're either born with it or you're not. And that would be my message. And I would just be like, look, my life is proof. From the time I was 12, Corey, I knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker and I knew that I could get rich doing it. And had that plan worked, by the way, which it would have if I had listened to people in film school, but I didn't. And I'm actually a little bit glad now seeing like what it forced me to learn. But if that path had worked, I would be preaching natural talent right now. 
but it didn't work. It all fell to pieces. And I really had to cobble together that mindset. Remind me what your question was. I'm tempted to vamp, but I'll just... Uh, just basically, how do you stay so focused or how did you reinforce oh, and yeah. the Yeah. So I knew that habits. I wanted to be rich, right? And yeah. luckily it was that I I knew that I could do it by doing something that I loved. And so that hunger, which I had so fed into for years, literally from the time that I was 12, telling people I was going to do it. And the, the tricks and techniques that I have are so simple that I don't think people are really listening to what I say. So one, just tell people, say it out loud. Then you're going to be embarrassed if you don't live up to it. Most of us don't like to be embarrassed. So we're going to go way out of our way to make sure that we do it. So one of the things that I did was I told the team, I'm going to Babe Ruth this motherfucker and I'm going to call our shots. And before we even launch this company, we're going to put on the website exactly what we're going to do. And we're not going to couch it. We're going to say we're building a studio bigger than Disney, just simple as. Now I've said it so many times. Like if I don't do that, like the amount of pressure that I would feel, uh, that I would have let the team down, that I would have let myself down. So that keeps me going that. And I say things to myself, like I'm the type of person that I'm the type of person that always does and believe what leads me towards my goals. I'm the type of person that always has very clear goals. I'm the type of person that doesn't let people that I love down on and on and on so that I have my identity keeping me focused and hungry and pushing. And I want to point out that you're using specific language that you're telling yourself. And that's huge because a lot of times people don't realize that they're always kind of talking to themselves or, you know, why did you fail at that? Or why do you suck at that? You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. You're not good enough. As opposed to saying, I'm the type of person, I say the same thing to myself all the time. I'm the type of person that believes I can accomplish anything as long as I'm willing to work hard enough for it. Something my dad told me or my mom is they foster that in my environment. And I really, really believe it. I've, every time I've failed, I never go, oh, you know what? I'm not good enough. I always go, I needed to work harder. That's it. I just need to put more hours in. Um, I want to talk about beliefs because you, the matrix is the mindset, right? And there's that, um, you talk about a lot where a fish is in water and water so ubiquitous, so ever present that it doesn't even know it's in water. Right now, we could be in the matrix and we don't even know we're in the matrix because our mindset, our story, what we tell ourselves every day is so ever present that we don't even realize we're in it and that we can change it. So one of the big things is the matrix is basically just our mindset, but our mindset is based on beliefs and beliefs are a construct that we can change. I'm curious, what's one belief that you have or that you changed from a young kid to where you are now? The most important is just the very notion that you can get better. And I just believe that there were, you could get better at the technical side, but I never believed you could get better at talent. Mm -hmm. um, that was huge, utterly transformative. Now, everybody says that one, so I'll give you one that's more unique. What you build your self-esteem around matters. And I used to build my self-esteem around the idea of being smart and right. And that's very fragile because inevitably you're going to meet people smarter than you and you're going to be wrong a lot more than you are right. So if you're building your self-esteem around those two things, you're going to end up feeling badly about yourself, which is why after film school, I felt terrible because I realized I wasn't talented. And I thought that that was an indictment of who I not only was, but who I could be and that it was a, a permanent state. I failed and was a failure. So in that, you just get caught in these loops of wanting to put yourself in smaller and smaller arenas so that you're always the smartest. You're always right more than anybody else. And in doing that, you're never going to have the kind of success you want. So I had these goals. They were very big, very ambitious, but my act, my actions weren't backing them up because my identity, my self-esteem, my pride was all around something that was forcing me in the opposite direction. So People don't commit suicide because they fail. They commit suicide because they believe that they're a failure and that they're never going to feel good about themselves again. So what I did was switch my self-esteem to being the learner and being able to admit that I was wrong faster than anybody else, identify the right answer faster than anybody else, and put the energy into that. And so in doing that, it's what Nassim Taleb calls an anti-fragile personality. Is that just a, a decision you made? One, one second, you're like, you know what? I'm going to be the learner. Literally, it's the most binary thing that ever happened to me. It is the one that, while you can't really film it because it would all be internal, it's the one thing in my story that was from one minute to the next. It was radically different. And I think that goes back to what you're talking about. Some of the simple things that you do every day that not a lot of people always hear. They want this crazy secret sauce, but it's just every single day, I'm going to be the learner. 
It's every single day making that decision because I could easily make the same decision, sit home, play video games, go out on the weekends. That's it. And that would be the end of my life, but that's not what I want. So every single day I make really easy, simple decisions. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to work out. You know, I'm going to accomplish a goal. I'm going to write something down. Um, I find that very, very interesting. And there was another thing you were talking about too, it was just um, belief and, and there's the millennial generation and even Generation Z, as they're coming into the workforce, there's this huge internal struggle where, you know, they they want to work and they want to kind of make some money, but they want to be fulfilled and they want to feel like they have purpose. And I meet so many of them that just struggle with the drive. They go, how do you find the motivation or, you know, how do you have this big goal and vision? And they just want some sort of purpose in life. What kind of advice can you give to them as they enter the workforce um, and maybe they're, they're working for an employee or they want to do something on their own? They want something that's really fulfilling. What kind of advice could you give to this new generation? As they well, first and foremost, understanding that this is all a process, that none of this, the language that people use here matters. So people talk about finding your passion. They talk about finding your purpose or finding your mission and you don't find it, you develop it. So this it's, it's discovery versus development. Right now, if you think that you're going to look inward and discover a hidden mission, meaning, and purpose in your life, you're going to forever be frustrated. One, you're going to go to work. It's going to take up so much of your time and energy that you're not going to be looking inward, identifying what's really happening, which is that you have little flickers of interest in your life. And your job is to develop those first into a fascination and then into a full-blown passion. But you do that development work by fanning those flames, by engaging, by gaining mastery, by working at it, and recognizing the difference between something that is boring and hard and something that really isn't right for you. So gaining mastery is boring and hard, period. It doesn't matter what. I don't care if you want to be a football star, if you want to be the greatest teacher of all time, or if you want to be a nuclear physicist. Like All of it entails doing a lot of work that to, to really master. You just have to do it over and over and over. And the easiest way to explain it is to think of a musician. So if you want to be a world-class musician and you want to get to the point where the music is essentially flowing through you, you have to practice scales day and night day and night so that A, you're hardwiring the movements physically, your ability to really rapidly read the music, your ability to just have chunked, as they call it in chess, all of that information so that your brain is literally rewiring itself to be optimized to play music. And in that process, like fighting through the boredom is where most people tap out. So understanding that like, okay, the, the scale that I'm playing is boring, but my desire to be a world-class musician and, and feel that sort of quote unquote effortless music performance is so great and so intoxicating that I'm going to fight through the boredom. And people expect to already feel that way about something when it's just a flicker of interest. Right. And that's the problem. Uh, I got a younger sister who's 11 years younger than me. And sometimes, you know, I see her and I see other people make a, uh, I have two younger sisters, by the way, I don't want to exclude the other one, <laughs> but the youngest one, she's not sure. And she, you know, sometimes they struggle to make a decision. And I see a lot of people where I don't want to make a decision because I don't, what if I'm wrong? And I think people need to understand that it's okay to pick something, to fuel the flame, right? To fan it yourself for a little bit. And then say, you know what, that's not right for me. And I, you know, sometimes people think you're intelligent because I, I went through dental school and I got into residency, but I almost think I was stupid because I, I felt that in the beginning. I was just, you know what, this might not be right for me. And I wasn't flexible enough. I committed. And before commitment was like, I got to do everything. Now I'm committed to my goals, but I realize I have to be flexible in the approach. Um, so is there anything that you kind of put to the side? I mean, I know film school was maybe that was one. Did you put that to the side? And was there anything else that you pursued and we're like, you know what, this isn't really working for me right now. I'm going to put it to the side and pursue something else. Yeah. I mean, look, I just left quest to start impact theory. Right. So, um, I'm incredibly committed to my goals, as you said, and I don't give a shit about the path. So the path is like relevant and it really comes down to knowing. So there's this, and I re and I keep saying, I'm going to look it up and I never do shame on me. Uh, <laughs> But there's. I'm going to hold you accountable to this. Rightly so. And Chase, will you write this down? Because the problem is, I always think about it during podcasts and then I forget. Uh, whoop, W O O P. 
I read about it from a guy named Eric Barker in his book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, but he's quoting someone else. And it is always to someone else that I can't remember. Uh, but whoop is wish, outcome, obstacle, plan. So wish, it's not enough to wish for something. You've got to know exactly what the outcome is that you want. So I want to pull people out of the matrix, right? So um, what's the obstacle? Well, how the hell do you do that? Most people are antagonistic to being pulled out of the matrix. So and this literally is what I went through. I didn't have whoop at the time, but this was my thought process. So if I know that the vast majority of people, and I used to think of the inner cities. So in the inner cities, most people just don't encounter the mindset. So if they're not seeking it out, how do I get them to encounter the mindset, knowing that people then fear change and all of that? How do I get them to en encounter it and really internalize it? And I realized, plan, that the way that we already do that, the way that humans assimilate truly disruptive information is through narrative, story, fiction. And so I was like, wow, this is amazing because one of the deepest passions of my life is storytelling. The reason it's one of the deepest passions of my life is because it is how I've structured my life to become successful. So it isn't me trying to shoehorn something into, oh, I was into film and so I'm going to make this fit. I was into film because of its ability to do this. And so marrying those two, bringing them together and really seeing that just when you break it down, there's a reason that when a dictator or somebody comes into a government, the first thing they do is take over the media because it's, it's how we get these ideas to spread rapidly. It's how we get ideas that really sink in. It's why stories of heroics and songs and poetry will forever be a thing. It's how we communicate these ideas that are meant to inspire people, become internal and become part of them. Uh, it's also the reason, by the way, that the studio is not called Bill U Studios. It's called Impact Theory because I don't think people can take ownership of me until I transcend and become an idea and I'd have to die for that and I'd rather not <laughs> have a pillar of you in the front right. yard <laughs> so much rather create something that people can really take ownership of so anyway that's you, you have to go through that process when you go through whoop and you walk through what that plan is going to be and you're excited it's the right thing when you walk through what the plan is going to be and you're like oh dear god going to dental school that sounds horrifying doing my residency that sounds it. horrifying right then switch immediately I take, I'll take that back because I do believe that everything, I used to think that life happened to me and um, that it was really, life was just fucked up, man. And I was like, all right, I, this is what I have to do. I have to suffer through this entire time. And I'm actually glad for that pain though, because it brought me to that point of desperation. So I appreciate so much what my career has afforded me the ability to do, to pursue my passion, to be here talking with you. And so in that regard, looking back, I'm glad that happened because I, like you said, if it's film school, had you listened to everybody, would you be here right now? You don't know. Had I taken a different path, because I did acting when I was in college, had I taken a different path, would I have ever come to that realization or that point where I needed to make these massive changes and I wouldn't change who I am today for anything. And I just keep on moving forward. I'm super inspired by everybody around me and I just want to do more and help more. Mm. I want to become more as well. I believe you become more first, you do more, and then you can give more. Uh, speaking of building a business, though, as you continue to grow impact theory, if a new entrepreneur is out there, what's some recommendations you'd advise them to do and maybe some mistakes that they can avoid in the early stages of a startup? Uh, specifically in the early stages of a startup, you want to make sure that your product is solving a problem. I think that a lot of people don't address that. Um, so make sure that you have a very specific niche that you're addressing. If you're trying to be all things to all people, I don't think you're going to be anything to anyone. Um, so like getting the product right getting your market identified is critical and then understand that you have to have business savvy. So if you're the visionary person and you don't have an operations person, you're fucked. So get one partner with somebody, understand that you can do a lot more as a team than you can as an individual. That's important. If you're starting your first startup, you must read the book, the E-Myth Revisited by Michael yeah. Gerber. Just absolutely, absolutely critical. It's a fantastic book. I love and, it. And he'll stop people from making the mistakes. So the biggest mistake people make is they work in their business and not on their business, right? Mm -hmm. And so he just details the living shit out of that. So um, go into that. that. That's probably the biggest one. And then understand that there are only three things at your disposal. Work long, hard, and smart. Um, and if you think that working hard and smart is enough, you're going to get eaten by people like me that do all three. So just recognize that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. No, those were fantastic. And I love the Eve myth uh, revisited. Just 
blew my mind when I was reading that. I was like, oh, if you're always working in your business, you can never work on your business. You can never actually grow it or expand it. You're just, you're just an employee. That's, that's the exact opposite of what entrepreneurs I think want. Right. Um, it, I want to just kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about who's your inspiration in your life and why. Man, the, uh, this is going to be the answer that nobody wants to hear because it is so mundane. And that is my wife. That's beautiful. My mom once told me something that was so profound and it really shook me because she put words to what exactly what I was feeling. So I, I have told exactly one woman that I loved her and that is my wife. Um, so I'm, I, I am not somebody who desperately seeks out relationships. So let's be really clear on that. And I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I didn't just see the look you two shared, which is really <laughs> cool by the way. And I'm super tempted. In fact, tell me a little bit more about that for those watching at home. That was really beautiful. That was really so, cool. Uh, I, I honestly, I admire your relationship with Lisa a lot. And I've seen you guys talk and just the way you spoke about her just now. And I, I really did. I meant that when I said, that's beautiful, like that she's your inspiration. And I looked over at her because and she's the love of my life. And I'm like, damn, get me, man. Uh, I looked, that was a moment that I wasn't going to share, but okay. So I just, I saw the love and passion and that, inspired in me like the love that I have for her and when I looked over to her I saw that same love and I just appreciated it so deeply right there that's really cool man full respect I'm such a huge sucker for love so you can count me in so, so yeah the the words Thanks. that no man for sure and that's really cool I love seeing that um the words that my mom said to me were you'll know you're in love when you are utterly convinced no two humans have ever felt the way that you guys feel about each other and I thought, that is exactly how I feel. There's no, like nothing would ever get done if other people felt about their significant other the way that I feel about mine. It's just not possible. And obviously that's hubris, but that, that was actually how it felt. Like there's no way somebody else feels this way about another human being. It's just not possible. And uh, that really is the just absolute center of my universe. She pushes me to be a better version of myself. She inspires me with how hard she works on herself. Um, yeah, she's just incredible. And I'm not foolish enough or egotistical enough to think that I would have accomplished what I've accomplished without her. So um, that's just the truth. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I wanted to ask just because I've noticed that as I've done all these interviews and I talk to people, it seems, I mean, so many of them are just this power couple where they just reinforce and work together. What are some tips? Because sometimes that, that can cause problems in a relationship, um, you know, where you're working together all the time, as well as being an intimate partner. Mm. Um, what are some tips that you have for guiding through a relationship and a business partner? Man, that, that is a huge question that literally we want to write a book about. That's what our show Relationship Theory is all about. The, the biggest thing is rules of engagement. You've got to agree, like actually say out loud what your roles are. So what are your roles in the company? Like, for instance, when we started this company, I said in no uncertain, in fact, I said these exact words. Um, I want you to be my co-founder. I cannot think of anyone that will be more effective for the business and that I would rather be in business with, but make no mistake, we're going to be executing on my vision and my vision alone. So if you can get excited about that, that's fucking awesome. And obviously I want your input because I think you'll be so amazing for the business. But when two ideas come into conflict, it will be my idea that we move forward with. And she was like, yeah, hundred percent. And so the roles that we want to play, by the way, I want to be the leader. I want that. I want that pressure. I want people looking to me. If somebody bursts in right now with a gun, I want people to turn to me. I want that, right? So when you want that, then it's like you have at least a shot of being a good leader because it'll be something that's rewarding for you to have that pressure, to hold yourself to an absurdly high standard. She does not want that. Mm -hmm. She wants to follow me. Now that is not saying that my role is better. They're just roles. So we watched this documentary on wolves and in Western society to say that you're the alpha has become synonymous with saying that you're better. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such horseshit a and B is so destructive to everyone else in the organization yeah. that how are other people supposed to find their value and really know what they're about when you're just saying, well, I'm the best, 
right? So I wanted to make it clear to her, that is my role. That is what I want for myself. That's the pressure that I find intoxicating. And for her in the wolf community, a beta is oftentimes bigger, stronger. It's the enforcer. It's the one that creates the space for the alpha to make the decisions. So the beta is saying, look, that's not where either I want to be or where I shine. Where I shine is playing this role. Now, without one, you can't have the other. So that to me was what became so interesting about our dynamic is I want that position and she wants her position. She doesn't want mine and I don't want hers, but I don't think mine is better. And nor does she think mine is better, by the way. Like she's well aware that this is a 50-50 partnership. And when we created the company legally, (laughs) I told the lawyers, I said, create the ultimate divorce nightmare. Literally everything is co-owned. And if her and I ever self-destruct, the company is fucked. And I said, Everyone's just going to have to get very comfortable with the fact that we've already built a billion dollar business together. We've been together for 17 years. Like we, we've worked this shit out. So what are your roles? State it, be very clear, come up with rules of engagement. How do you deal with a disagreement? How do you want to treat each other? How do you treat each other in public? How do you deal with something in private? I just on and on and on, like define everything, including words. Like we actually have definitions just for the two of us. What does it mean when you say something's important? What do you mean when you say, I promise? Like really defining this stuff. That's like common language. You say, I can't take, do this right now. This is really important. Well, what do you mean? Right. And if she says important, then what? Cool. Like stop everything. Yeah. Either immediately address what she's asking me to do or immediately stop whatever I was doing because she asked me to stop. Got it. Now, you can't be abusive. And if my wife were always like, oh, that's important. It's important. It's important that you go get me a drink out of the fridge. It's important that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then it's like, all right, come on. Now it's, it's, you're being abusive. And so I no longer take it seriously. It's the boy who cried wolf, right? Exactly. Yeah. So well, that was awesome. And thanks. And I'm definitely going to take down some tips because I think that's really great to really define the roles and even the language too. Uh, I wanted to go over, actually, we'll just lighten it up real quick. Who's your favorite superhero? Uh, will you let me give a non-superhero answer? 100%. So Neo from the Matrix isn't technically a superhero, but that's actually the person that I like the most. I usually say Iron Man, but if I'm really honest, like I rediscovered Daredevil recently. And if, so there's sort of two um, canons in the comic book world. One where the toxic waste that gets in his eyes actually give him superpowers. And one where he just has to develop his keen sense of hearing and all of that as a way to overcome the fact that he's blind. In that canon, he's my favorite where he's just had like Batman. He's had to like work his ass off. Also as somebody that has a deep level of anxiety growing up, the man without fear was so exciting to me. And especially because he had technically a handicap. I found that really cool. All right, on. I like that. Um, what you, you're so work driven. I've heard you say that if I'm awake, I'm either working or working out. Correct. What do you do for fun? <laughs> well, so here's the key. And this is the only reason this works. I'll say 60% of what I do for work is fun. So 60% of the time I'm, I'm on cloud. Nine. Like right now, this is marketing for me, right? Like being on your podcast, getting a chance to explain this, a, whatever audience that you have, I get to reach, which is amazing. And I'm insanely grateful. And then B, I get to practice saying this stuff, thinking through it. Right. So this is actually work, but I love it. And this is a lot of fun. Tonight, I'm going to do one of my endless Q&As. I have no idea how long it will last. Some are an hour long and some have been nine hours long. But I love that. And like pulling people out of the matrix, going to your earlier question, like I love that. That moment of awakening, being of service to people, showing them, like understand, think about where this ends up 10 years from now, where time after time after time, I've shown my community, I will suffer for you. I will do anything and everything I can to give to you, to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish. And when it's in person, they get a chance to look me in my eye and see when I've been doing this for nine hours. Am I like, all right, guys, I got to go, man. Come on, wrap it. Like, what's the question? Or am I totally chill? They get to see that. They get to feel that. And the, the famous quote, I don't remember who said it, but no one remembers what you say. They don't even remember what you do, but they remember how you made them feel. So getting a chance to do that and it's work. Like, so 40% of the time I fucking hate it. And it's all about hunger, grit, desire. And then it's, it's identity and it's being the kind of person that's willing to suffer. But so there's two things you talked about there. I'll just go with this one is after nine hours, you know, how do you have the energy? I've heard you say you go to bed at nine o'clock and you wake up at two 30 sometimes or four, whatever it is, you get like four or five hours of sleep. 
day in, day out, how do you find the energy to continue going? So first and foremost, because I don't want this to get mythologized, when I need sleep, I get sleep. I prioritize sleep. I go to bed at 9 p.m. and I do not wake up with an alarm. So I sleep as long as I need. So if I needed nine hours, I'm going to get nine hours. Now that I've said that, I think that energy creation is a function of two things. One, ATP is real. And once you can no longer generate ATP in your cells, you fucking die. So take care (laughs) of your mitochondria, boys and girls, uh, which is why I eat right. And I eat right all the time. So if I cheat four times a year, I'd be shocked. Now I take my calories up and on the weekends I take my calories up, but understand I'm a morbidly obese man hiding in a lean man's body. So all you need to do is look at my family. I have the genetics of truly of somebody that I put on fat so easily. It's comical. If I were cheating, you can actually hear me getting fatter. It is crazy (laughs) town how easily I put on adipose tissue. So really, really, truly like respect your physiology. I work out I hate it, but I do it because it optimizes cognitively and physically. So because of all that, diet, exercise, all that, I just have high levels of energy, first of all. And then second, I truly believe energy is a question of motivation once ATP is out of the way. So let's just set that out of the way, right? And the diet you do is the ketogenic diet, right? Not always. Not I, always. Uh, right now I'm high protein. So I oh. do a week of what I'm doing right now. This isn't always the case, but I go one week high protein, the next week keto, the next week high protein, the next week keto. Interesting. But I've gone nine months being keto before. I've gone three years being high protein. So it's- I've done high protein. We do a ketogenic diet sometimes and we've done carb cycling, right? So it's really strict ketogenic for six days and then you eat carbs on the seventh day, which is fun for like, if you want to go out on the weekend and have some- <laughs> food. Sure. Um, but I found that honestly, a high intake of carbs, sometimes like that's where you get sleepy. And when we're on the ketogenic diet or more the keto phase, it's, it's clean energy. You're awake. You never have those dips. Uh, and that's how always helped me kind of stay a little bit more focused. And I think the second thing is probably similar things. So I'll let you continue with that. The second thing you were saying. Oh, motivation. So yeah. if you just ran a marathon and you're like, I literally can't take another step. And then a grizzly bear were about to attack your woman. You'd get up and fucking fight the grizzly. True? Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> so that's motivation, right? You just like at that point to be who I am, I have to get up and fight. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden the adrenaline, all of that is going to course. And and now you can back it off. It doesn't have to be something that ridiculous, but it's like, if I were just incredibly, incredibly spent like the other day, in fact, last week may have been the single busiest week of my life. It was absolute absurd. It was, it was just absurdity. And just when I thought I was getting ahead for the day, it was like six o'clock and I thought, okay, I, the next three hours I can really research and prepare for the episode tomorrow. And my assistant pinged me and was like, don't forget, you have to write the newsletter. And I thought for the love of God, like just when you think you're finally getting ahead of this insane week and I had one more thing to do. And I thought, yeah, like man up. This is the life you chose. You really want to pull people out of the matrix or not? You really building the studio or not? You Are you sincere about this community? And my motivation for that is so strong. My hunger is so strong. There was like, yeah, you just fucking write it. You don't complain about it. You don't put it off. You just do it. Just do it. I love that. And recently I've been, I, two things come to mind. An object of motion stays in motion. You know, sometimes you come home and you sit down on the couch and you just stop moving as opposed to if you just keep going, it's just easier and easier to keep going. The other thing about just doing it that's been so effective in the last six months for me is I used to be kind of a perfectionist. And so about, you know, I was like, I got to get a hundred percent. It's got to be absolutely perfect. Can't have a misspelled letter. And now I just do it to about 90, 95. I mean, if I, even if I got an 85, you know, cause in school, if you're taking a test, you take the test, it's over. You know, you don't, you don't get a second shot. You don't redo it. You don't re-edit it. I mean, yeah, if there's something really important, you want to perfect it as much as you can, but eventually you just got to do it. And that's a big thing that sometimes stops people from taking action. And so speaking about taking action, um, I believe heavily in the 80, 20 rule. I'm sure you've heard of that. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, so 80% of our results come from about 20% of our actions. And I think the key is just finding the best actions to give you the biggest result. Um, so a few things as far as you're in a, a fantastic leader. I mean, you've built several different companies and you really are creating a community. So as a leader, what would be three or it doesn't have to be three, but just some actions that you could take to become a better leader? Well, I think 
the only way to be a good leader is to lead by example. So then it gets starts getting really specific about what's your thing. But I will say the, the things that come closest to being universal are have a growth mindset in the fucking extreme. So for instance, I have actually asked, so we did this whole day, uh, captive, not a whole day. We did a half day, tell the truth, uh, <laughs> of um, this book called Captivate by Vanessa Van Edwards, who was a guest on Impact Theory. Amazing. And reading her book really was super impactful for me. So as a team, we sat around and we had this half day of the Captivate um, workshop where we were going through and telling each other, like, what's our, excuse me, what's our uh, language of appreciation? What's our primary value? Like all these things. And one of them was like, how do you want your feedback? And for me, I want my feedback as aggressive as possible and as public as possible, because that will give me a chance to show people I can take the feedback, even when it is truly aggressive criticism, that I will be open to it. And if it's real, I will immediately begin putting into, into practice the adjustment to my behavior that I never need you to pull me aside, nothing. Like as a team, I want us all to like see what that looks like, that I'm not going to get emotional about it. I'm not going to lash out at you. I'm really instantly within milliseconds, I'm going to orient myself to the fact that I'm being criticized. I'm going to open myself up to that information. I'm going to assess it. I'm going to thank you. Um, and you know, then we'll move and act accordingly. It doesn't always mean I'm going to take um, the advice. Not you, know, you have to be discerning. You have to know when somebody's right about something and when they're not, but you should always be open, always, mm -hmm. always, always to really hear them out. So setting that example, outworking people, no one will ever fucking outwork me. Like that is just period. So, and I said that back at Quest where it was physically demanding labor. So for about two years, I showed up every day and I was wearing a hairnet and a lab coat and gloves and making protein bars, not observing other people making protein bars. I was making protein bars. And I would come on and say, what's the worst job? And I would take that job and I would do it. And I would do it with energy, enthusiasm, excitement, laughter, like getting people amped up and energized so that when I asked you to work at 2 a.m. on a Friday, you could not ever say, well, what about you? Right? right. Like you may still be pissed, but you're never going to say that I wasn't willing to do something. And I remember a time where the toilet overflowed and there was literal human feces on the floor. I did not ask the janitor to clean it up. I cleaned it up because I wanted people to know I will never ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And I remember in that moment, I thought I'm going to pick this shit up <laughs> because I want to be able to tell the story later that I'll pick shit up. Like whatever it takes, no one's going to outwork me and I'm never going to ask people to do something I wouldn't do. So yeah, just willingness to do everything. I love it. Uh, how you've obviously, to become this successful, you've had to deal with some failures. How do you deal with a failure? Can you think of one recently or something, but how do you deal with it and, and move on? God, can I think about, yeah, I, look, I fail every day. So uh, it's just always finding one that's juicy. The, the easiest, the go-to one for me is always film school because it was so devastating and it was so public and so embarrassing. So, and I, I just sort of skimmed over it in this interview. So I'll tell it in a little bit of detail right now. So film school is really only two years. The first two years of, um, this is USC film school. The first two years were like general education requirements. So my first two years were all about getting grades good enough to get into film school. Um, so bust my ass for two years, get good grades, get into film school. Um, the first year is broken into like two really big uh, movements. And I did well in both of those movements. And then your senior year. So I really started getting people's attention for being a quote unquote, talented filmmaker. Um, your the second half of your um, first year of like real production, you like everybody breaks up into these two man teams and everybody wanted this one guy. So you break up into a director and cinematographer. Needless to say, most people want to be a director. So becoming, convincing someone to be your cinematographer is very hard, which I did that. And then I convinced the cinematographer that everybody wanted and everyone thought was going to be a director. So already it was like, whoa, like these guys are like the dynamic duo. It's going to be amazing. It's called a 310. Our 310 smashed. I thought it was one of the best. Got a great reaction from the class. You end up pitching to only four people out of your whole class get to do this thing called a 480, which is the senior thesis. They give you a budget. It was like $35,000. So, I mean, wow. you really get to like do something. And which back then, I mean, keep in mind, this is 97, 98. Um, 
that was like a big deal. I get selected. I'm one of the four. So like, I'm thinking, dude, the three picture deal is mine to have. I am like, everything's going well. You I've would crushed get a in three picture deal. No, no, no. I was so, just like, that's oh, the fantasy, oh, right? right? That was you do dream. the senior thesis. It's so good that you take that around to agents. You get your three Got picture it. deal and then it's all going to be amazing. And I fear that I've said that like that a hundred times before. And people thought that it's not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination, but that was the fantasy. And I get the 480 and I fuck it up so royally. And the film is so bad and so embarrassing that I can only imagine like how often I was being made fun of. I mean, it was just the times that were to my face was bad enough, but it was like, I just can't imagine. It was just a catastrophic failure. And so I was in the middle of campus laying on the ground on a payphone, saying to my mom, like, my life is over. Like, what do I do? I've totally failed. And now, by the way, I'm graduating out into the real world without a film to show for it. So what do I do? Because this is all before like camcorders and YouTube. Like there's no, oh, just go make a film for $5,000. That doesn't exist. No cell phones with smart no, like, cameras it, it, and everything. 100K is like the minimum barrier to entry. Like once you're not out of film school. So I was just like, oh, dear God. So you're sitting there. You don't have an answer. Obviously, this was like that five-year period of turmoil, maybe, um, about that time. How did you start to, how do you deal with failure on a constant basis? I mean, because you've got to fail right now, right? I mean, I, every time I do something, sometimes I, on you the fail. daily. Yeah. yeah. So, how do I, how I dealt with it then is very different than how I deal with it now. Now, truly, all I can see is the learning opportunity. So, like you, when I fail, I say I didn't work hard enough. I didn't have the right answer. I wasn't um, seeing it from the right angle. So, I'm looking for what's the real solution. So, I always own it. Um, essentially, weekly, I will say to the team, like, hey, here's what I don't think I did well last week. Um, going back to setting the tone as a leader, that's how I want them to react when I think they did something poorly. I don't want them panicking, thinking I'm going to fire them. It's not <laughs> fucking interesting, right? Nobody right. does their best work from a place of fear. So I want them to see every week, look, I'll can the things I did well, I'll be the first to say, I think I crushed that. But if I didn't, I want you to see, like, own it. Say what you're going to do next time to avoid it. Let me know what you learned. And so that's what I do. And I just say, look, I don't think I did. And sometimes it's an interview. I don't think I did it as well as I could have. I think I could have done better. Here's where I think I went wrong. I had the wrong angle, maybe coming into it. Maybe I didn't have enough time to research, like whatever. And so I'm going to clear my schedule next time or whatever the case may be. So for instance, we just had that week where it was just fucking insanity and all these like opportunities coalescing all at once. And in the future, I will not, I'll just say no to some of them. You just have to. Mm -hmm. And so any one of those opportunities seemed unpass upable, if that's a word, <laughs> uh, but you just have to, because the, the, w at least one of my interviews suffered and out of respect for the guest, uh, I won't say which one it was that I thought suffered. Cause who knows the episode right. episodes in the past that I thought were terrible. People were like, Oh my God, this is my favorite episode ever. So I realize it's sort of irrelevant. What I think. Who's uh, one of your favorite people that you've interviewed? I was just listening to the Jason Silva one and I love Jason Silva shots of awe videos and, and flow. And on the way up here, we were listening to the Peter Diamandis and mm. uh, you know, you're uh, on the board for X prize. Um, what's been one of your favorite uh, interviews that you've done and why? So both of those are amazing. amazing. Jason and Peter are two of my favorite human beings on the planet. My favorite episode though, without question is David Goggins. Oh, okay. Like that, that researching David Goggins changed me as a human being. Truly. Fantastic. Uh, he is just unbelievable. So yeah, he's my favorite. Somebody that I, I interviewed back at Inside Quest, who I just want the world to know about. It's a guy named Faraz Zahabi, who is an MMA coach. He coaches um, George St. Pierre okay. yeah. um, and, and a bunch of other amazing people at TriStar Gym. That guy is, is his mind is, is a national treasure and he's Canadian. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they often say that you are a product of the five people you surround yourself with the most. Yes. Uh, if you didn't have your five people that you have in your team right now, who would you be looking to get? Because I, I, sometimes people ask me that and I say, I get a lot of people through podcasts like you and books or events. Um, some people that I you would, you know, if I didn't have anybody who I surround myself in kind of that world would be like a Tony Robbins or Gary V, uh, Tim Ferriss, which I know you interviewed as well. Um, you know, just all these different people who would be your five people that you would want to surround yourself with? People that like people listening will actually recognize. Or, I mean, just, 
No, I mean, who, whoever's your five, man. I mean, I would have you right there next to me. I just want to I follow want you. It. Like you're on this path that's so amazing to me because impact theory, a lot like unleash success is all about helping people take action. And so I think that you have to surround yourself with people that are constantly driving towards that same goal and vision. And I see yours is just a very similar path and we'll reach people in different ways, but I hope to be able to, you know, see you again and know that we're doing the same thing or whatever your vision is. But I feel that it's very very connected. So it doesn't have to be anybody that they re recognize, you know, I mean, it could be, it could be your wife, obviously is going to be probably one of them if you want to surround yourself, but it could be anybody. Yeah. So, well, she's already my five. So, right. and, you know, honestly, right now my team is, is that right. So I don't spend, um, more time with anybody. I spend way more time with these guys in my own family, like way more time. Uh, so the, the truth is it would have to be people that are aligned with what I'm trying to accomplish. So there are, these are, these are not the, the honest answer is I, it's not like I have five other people waiting in the wings. Mm -hmm. So it would become, I like, if I lost the, the team, the first thing I would do is find other exceptional people to fill those roles. Right. So I don't consider myself, um, I don't want to deal with operations, so I'm going to need somebody to handle operations. Um, I'm going to need a killer marketing team. So it's like piece by piece, I, I build those back up. But so uh, I guess I, maybe I reward that, like your team that functions as your support team in Impact Theory, but maybe if someone else was out there, right? Like where you're looking for let's do this, information. Let's do my fantasy league. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that'll be a little, yeah. that's what I meant. Sorry, I didn't say it well. That's what I meant by people that people will have heard of. Um, Elon Musk is untouchable right now. So like that guy Some in inspires the shit out of me like just he's dreaming bigger than anybody else and he's executing bigger than anybody else so that's like biography? the fantasy combo yeah. uh the biography yes yeah but if he has something that came out a few years ago right uh by ashley vance I sure think. maybe almost yeah. certainly it was I, a woman for shways so I'll say yes. Okay. All right. So I, was, I read a biography of him I think there are several okay yeah it was I mean just fantastic like his drive and his vision I, how do you go, I'm going to start an electric car company, a space travel station company, a Hyperloop company. I mean, he's got this boring tunnel. It, I, Bonkers. every time I'm just like, wow, how does, where does he find the time? You know, it's just amazing to watch. Um, and that's also Peter, Peter Diama, Diamandis. Diamandis, uh, yep. Diamandis. Uh, same thing with him, you know, mining planetary asteroids. Uh, just phenomenal. The, the Human Longevity Project, which I'm just like, oh my God, I want, I'm so excited. That guy is just incredible. We actually saw him speak one time on stage. It was just a phenomenal keynote. Um, so anyways, going on to your fantasy league, we got Elon Musk. Yeah, I'll take Peter D any day of the week. That dude is, is really exceptional. Um, I would take, man, if Faraz had let me pull him out of MMA, like I, the way his mind works is, is absolutely astonishing. Um, this guy is such a dark horse, but Brian Wood, Brian Wood, look him up. The author, this guy is writer in comic books. I think he's the most important writer working today. It is unbelievable. Uh, I've been stalking him. Uh, I like okay. every cat picture he puts on Instagram. Um, uh, th he's unbelievable. And because we're building a studio, that's critical. Uh, and I'll take Steven Spielberg for the win. That guy just, nice. can you really like do better than that? Right. So Spielberg, the longevity, the creativity uh, continues to be a relevant voice in filmmaking. Uh, I think he's unreal. I think we're going to need a producer in here. So I'll take JJ Abrams. Nice. Yeah. There we go. I love it. Fantasy league. Fantasy cool. league. Um, all right. So to wrap up, Thank you so much for all this value. A uh, couple questions just to end it here. What is one action you think somebody could take today or tomorrow that could immediately impact their entrepreneurial journey and, and grow their business? Ooh, so there are some assumptions that they've already started their business. Um, sure. So the, the honest answer is there is some thing that they know they need to do for their business and they're scared and they're not doing it. And maybe because of what you were talking about earlier, where it's got to be perfect, 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 perfect. So go do the 85% version of that just to get started. Do the 8% version of that. Just get it started. Do something. Take an action. Like that is stop thinking, start acting. That there you go. The yeah. So the action is to take action, but also to just stop thinking about it and just do it. Because I agree with you. You're only going to be able to measure the result, right? You can think what's going to happen in your mind the entire time, but until you actually take action, you're never going to know what the real result would be. 
100 so, percent um before we i ask you before i ask the last question uh where can people find you online so I'm super active socially at Tom Bilyeu across all socials. Last name is spelled B as in Bravo, I-L-Y-E-U. Um, YouTube, same thing, but forward slash Tom Bilyeu. Um, yeah, that's the best way. And then uh, you can also hit us up at impacttheory.com. Sign up for that newsletter, homies. Um, anything that is attributed to me socially, any comment, anything like that, that actually is me. So if you get so much as a heart, a thumbs up, anything that was my little digits pressing those keys, uh, I want people to know that will always be the case. Um, things that are, I'm actually working on a book right now. I'm working with a ghostwriter. So I will always full disclosure the things that are like actively me. Um, but socially speaking, it is me. Awesome. So the last question is you've been so successful up to this point in your life, but there's always that next level for you. What is that next level of success look like? Oh man, that's easy. So impact theory becomes a studio bigger than Disney that has more cultural impact than Disney. And I am well aware of what a big ticket item that is. Uh, but that that's it. And we want to be the first studio since Disney to have the discipline to only tell one kind of story. Um, and so if Disney is the most magical place on earth, we want to be the most empowering place on earth. Wow. That is, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to go. Uh, <laughs> um, Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been an honor to be able to sit here with you to, to kind of go through your mind. You are incredible. I'm truly, truly inspired uh, and honored to be here with you. Thank and you, thank man. you. Thank you for having me. If you guys enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that we have is please go subscribe. If you'd like to leave us a five-star rating and review, that definitely helps us get our message out there. Because each week, I'm going to interview amazing people. And I want to be able to give you more and more tools and strategies that get you real results. Feel free to connect with me on Facebook or Instagram at Corey Corpodian, or just visit the website at unleashsuccess.com. Remember, knowing is not enough. Knowledge alone is not power. Action is. Because action is the only way to get the results you want in life and truly live the life of your dreams. So go take some action. Subscribe to the podcast and get ready to unleash success in you.